What's up, guys? This is Billy Thorpe, Judson Brock. Another episode What's of up? Eastern Current. Super excited to be on here, Judson, talking about the Southern Flounder Amendment. Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody just take a deep breath real quick. It's going to be okay. We're going to you know, bring the show to you. We're actually going to get right into um uh, right into the show. We're not we're not going we're going to do some sponsor shout outs really quick uh and then we're going to talk about the show. We want to leave plenty of time to talk with Tom about such a controversial subject, an important subject, not just controversial, but very important for our community um and and really the the whole state of north carolina as far as the coastal areas go so i'm excited joe what do you, what do you think man i'm pretty excited too i, I think uh, i think it's gonna be a really good show i, I just have a, at the boat ramp and on instagram and social media a lot of people just asking me have you heard about the the founder amendment and i feel like a lot of people just have questions of, of you know like wh where did this come from yeah. why are we here and, and just want to know and so we're just excited to bring 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 a uh Bring, hopefully bring some good answers to some good questions. Yeah, man. Hopefully hopefully bring a lot of education. And I just saw Luke Donay jump on. So if you guys go to our first episode, uh, Luke Donay actually really wanted to talk about this. It was our Flounder episode. And, you know, we at that point we were kind of like, hey, we don't want to get too political. We don't want to do whatever. And he has some really good balanced ideas um, concerning that. So I just wanted to – I was going to mention that anyway. And then he said, hey, what's up? Uh, he's really passionate about it as well. So let's go ahead and just thank our sponsors. First of all, we want to thank uh, AFCO and Marshware. Those guys are awesome, always hooking us up. Uh, we'll see who else we got over great, there. Great, uh, great gear for uh, lifestyle and on the boat. And on the boat, yeah, man, a lot of good, a lot of goodies. And we're not going to be giving anything away on the show. Once again, we're going to save all of our time to really dive into this topic. Um, see a lot of people jumping on. So if you are jumping on with us, just be sure to shout out. Tell us where you're watching from. Uh, so we got AFCO, Marshware. We got CETO. Uh, Judge, I strike. We I strike. I strike. Mm -hmm. Huge, man. I'd like to share real quick that if you go on their website, you can order in bulk and you'll save up to 40% off. Oh, yeah, so dude, that's the way so to order sick. jigs. A lot of people out there fishing for a sheep's head, man. Get that gel bait. Yeah, that the gel, gel bait's, bait's killer. That's good. Uh, I saw some. Uh, somebody was telling me the other day that they were missing a ton of sheep's head. Want to know what we uh, would recommend? I was like, man, go get one of those. Everybody that's using it that I see is doing really well. Yeah. Uh, so do that. Uh, call Judd here if you want to go fishing and uh, Eastern Angling. You can see the shirt that he's got on there, uh, which Thorpe Creative, my company, really made. made so, this for me. oh yeah, man, looking good, dude. Looking Thanks, man. good. Um, Keep me looking so nice. yeah, and then CETO, if you get, you know, make sure you get a CETO membership, keep yourself protected and mentioning our sponsors. Once we get into the show, we want to keep kind of an arm's length as far as, um, anybody that says anything on this episode tonight, this could be a very controversial episode, big episode, a lot of important things going on. Be sure to, uh, you know, comment, like share all that stuff. But anything that we say is our personal opinion. We don't represent, AFCO, we don't represent Marshware, we don't represent any of our sponsors that just help us out and hook us up and, and make sure we all have a good time on here. So we don't want, <laughs> no matter how this goes, which I think we're all on the edge of our seat going, how's this conversation going to go? Are we equipped to handle it? Which I think we, you know, we got Tom Roller on with us, which is very smart, man. It's been been in it. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah, with one more just thing a minute. Go ahead. Is, uh, that I wanted to share is please, please, please go share on your Instagram story or your Facebook right now. Just share that we're live. Yeah, we want a lot of people to hear this because it's just going to be a lot of great questions. Um, some good, some good opinions and some good, uh, some good, some good questions and answers on here. So please, it helps us out a lot on this show as well as in the future. And with all the algorithms on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and our podcast, if you just share and, and, and like this, so please yeah. share it. Uh, and and we look forward and to speaking to of check it. out our podcast man doing a lot of doing yeah. a lot of work on there a lot of people are, are interacting with that so we really appreciate it and you can rate us on on itunes or wherever you check out podcasts to help us out so man what do you think john you want to go ahead and get into this let's get it let's bring no let's time bring the man on. like now so let's go ahead and bring tom on i'll just bring up three cameras what is going on tom, What's up, tom? hey guys thanks for having me on thanks for wanting to talk about this issue it's important to all of us for sure. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, we appreciate you, you coming on. And really, just to kind of uh, give a little backstory about our conversation, we were actually calling Tom to do a topwater fishing episode. Topwater Tom. Topwater Tom. <laughs> and he was so stoked about this subject and had so much good information that we said, okay, let's, you know, because we try to here at Eastern Current, our whole idea is to bring people together, bring our fishing community together and and really equip people to have more fun right we all are here to have fun and so we talked about the show and we said hey we'll do this show on the contingency that we really keep it uh, a fair even balance uh, as possible as much as possible and then also um you know like 
like kind of filter stuff through that. So if you're, yeah. if you want to be a part of the episode and, and comment and like, we'll definitely be answering questions and, and doing that thing, yeah. but we really want to keep it as fair and as balanced as possible. And, and with the mindset of this is going to educate us all and help us come together rather than tear people in the community apart. So well put, Billy. Well yeah. Put. So that's what we're doing. And if you don't want to do that, then, too bad for you. That's what we're doing. So Will Jones just said, uh, "Topwater Tom, <laughs> oh yes, yeah, Skitter Walk King." Skitter Walk. Okay. <laughs> the Skitter Walk King. The Skitter Walk King, man. There we go. All right, let's get into it, man. Let's so, get into so, it. so, so, Tom, first of all, just tell us a little bit. Like I said, you were so passionate about this subject that we couldn't say no about doing, um, uh, you know, doing an episode about it. So, man, share with us a little bit of your history and just where, you know, how you came into this, how you became so, you know, passionate and like, you know, I'm not going to say obsessed, but obsessed with with this subject. Can you give me a little backstory? If you're a full time guy, you're obsessed with fishing. Fair. Let's, be, let's let's be frank there. Right. So, you know, when you guys called me and were like, hey, you want to do a show on uh, top water fishing? I said, that's awesome. But, you know, there's a really good opportunity to talk about flounder and talk about the management of the species. You know, we have the Marine Fisheries Commission meeting at the end of this week, and there's been a lot of uh, online talking, complaining, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, when we talk about fisheries management, you know, it's, it, it, it ends up being controversial just kind of as a matter of fact. And, and, and that's unfortunate because, you know, as, as fishermen, those of us who fish for public resource, we're going to have to deal with this stuff, whether we agree with it, whether, you know, there's a lot of just, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders. So, you know, I, I look forward to, you know, having this conversation tonight about that. No, but as far as me, um, you know, I'm, I'm a full-time fishing guy inshore and near shore, um, based out of Beaufort, North Carolina, been doing it since 2003. That's nearly 16, 17 seasons. Um, you know, and I'm also an advocate for the recreational fishing community for uh, um, kind of sustainable fisheries management. Let's call it that. I, I believe in, in in abundance, you know, in abundance management. That's the idea that we leave more fish in the water so that when 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 we all go fishing, we have a better chance of having a, having a quality day. Um, and for me, where I really got interested in fisheries management was in the early 2000s when we, our our state was doing the first fisheries management plan for southern flounder, and that was after our our, our fisheries law called that governs our all of our state fisheries called uh, the Fisheries Reform Act of 1997 was really taking effect. Um, and I saw a lot of the let's start to say the early mismanagement of this fishery. You know, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to talk about, you know, one user group versus another, but this is when our state really started to kind of build this fishery as it is today. And right. it's been kind of an unfortunate road. Um, anyway, so. Okay, cool, man. So, and as far as diving into the topic at hand, which is this flounder amendment, let's talk a little bit, uh, just starting this out, is like... I mean, there's a lot of people. I even I was telling you guys earlier. There's a you know even a person that was on a Facebook page I'm a part of uh, that has to do with fishing here in North Carolina, and they like put it up there, and they're like, oh man, what is this? What is you know like? Did you guys know anything about this? And he was like really inquiring a lot of information, and then you know from there he got blasted with about 50 comments of people are you know arguing back and forth or whatever. But man, just break it down for us into layman's terms. What is this amendment? What is it about? What are they proposing on Thursday night that they'll decide on on Friday morning? So, you know, <laughs> fisheries is really complicated it is. to start there. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. Um, this isn't something that came out of nowhere. Our state, in how they manage our fisheries, we have what are called fisheries management plans. And we manage them, and the term amendment just means kind of like, it means it's it's the fisheries management plan is we look at it every in, in case of you know a lot of these species every five years, and me, and we have a stock assessment, and we look at what how things are going, and maybe we introduce new regulations, we maybe we introduce new management measures, um, and I, I and there's a lot of different mechanisms that exist within this within this. Um, within our fisheries management, but an amendment is just kind of a general term. I don't think we should get hung up too much on that, but um, basically put it this way is 
we, we submitted, we did our first stock assessment on Flounder in North Carolina, and, and I want to say 2002, 2003. Um, we did another one in the late 2000s, another one, you know, about 2015, 2014. That's a thing we can get into later. And this has been a um, kind of an ongoing process. This isn't, um, I think what's frustrating for me, somebody who's, who's active within the fisheries management process, I sit on the state uh, Southern Flounder Advisory Committee, is that this has been going on for a year. Okay. We've had several fisheries commissions meetings on it. We've had maybe a dozen advisory panel meetings, and this is just kind of the the last uh, the last vote on what this amendment process is. And this there's and there's a lot in it due to the stock assessment. So due due to the findings of the stock assessment. Okay, gotcha. So and, and, and so this is a question, guys. Please ask. You know. No, no. It's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So so really, I mean, just to be like politically correct, if we can, amendment is just going to be like a slight change that will. You know, it's like a slight change in a, you know, like legalities or whatever that's going to change the process somewhat. So, um, right. so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a change to to the law of how we can, you know, of, of keeping flounder yeah. essentially. So, how mm-hmm. do we get to this point that this conversation, you know, and, and like you said, every I believe you said five years that they're they're doing stock counts and doing different things like that. So, man, take us into the history of the flounder in our area and like, why the heck are we even having this conversation? You know, first of all, I think that's the important question because it's like, we can't learn to, to go forward unless we want to learn what we did to get to where we're at. If that makes any sense, I think. And, and once again, yeah. I'm coming from everybody watching this or listening to this podcast. Uh, I'm Billy. That's my name. I'm coming from a weekend warrior mindset. I I don't benefit directly from the industry. I don't, my bottom line doesn't matter. I I am a different type of business. So unlike Judson and unlike Tom uh, and unlike, you know, some commercial guys, which we'll get into commercial fishing here in a little bit, you know, it's like really how does, you know, so educate me, the, the weekend warrior guy, how, where do we get, how do we get to this level and how do we not come back to this level 15 years from now? So, the reason we are here is our state, the state of North Carolina, and our fisheries management processes fail us. The reason we are looking at a 72% cut come this Thursday or Friday is because of our the, the, the commission and the state's failure to take action in the past. Now, um, I'm going to throw out some general numbers here because I don't have the stats in front of me, but I think they're going to be pretty close. When we did our first stock assessment in 2005, in 2000, let's say 2003 to 2005, it was very clear that there was a problem, not just through the data, but also anecdotally. Um, and I think most fishermen would agree would agree with me. We definitely don't catch as many fish today as we did 10 years ago. Definitely not as many as we did 20 years ago. And I'm specifically talking about flounder here. Um, and in 2004, 2005, they were at the commission, the Marine Fisheries Commission, who is basically manages our you know our fisheries process the stock assessment required about a 40% reduction. They said a 20%. They said, they, well, we don't really like this. We're going to do 20%. So they did less. And it ended up probably being less than the cut than that. In 2009, when we did our next stock assessment. It was kind of the same thing. Um, they relied on some management measures um, that didn't really result in any sort of reduction in kind of harvest of the, of the, of the overall population. And this kind of went on into 2015. Now, the reason we are here is very specific. Um, I think many listeners here will remember this. one of the last controversial issues in North Carolina fisheries is our last stock assessment process resulted in a kind of a, um, a difficult stock assessment, which was, which was called, it wasn't considered. So they did this assessment in about 2015, 2014, 2015, and it didn't come out what they call useful for management. It showed that we had a huge problem, but it couldn't really quantify the cuts that we needed to. And again, guys, you know, pretty high level science. Um, the Marine Fisheries Commission voted to prove the supplement and, and make cuts at around the 50, 40 to 50% level. And it was probably a lot, it was, there was a lot of support for this on all sides of the spectrum. It wasn't, you know, well accepted. But the, the, uh, the North Carolina Fisheries Association, which is the kind of the commercial fishing trade association, sued the state of North Carolina regarding the supplement, and they won. And part of the settlement agreement was that we couldn't enact any more management measures until a full-blown amendment process, um, until a full-blown amendment process with an advisory committee and everything else 
and as well as the stock assessment was done. The state of North Carolina did a stock assessment in 2016, say 2017-ish, and um, they did it. It was a public process. Um, I went to the meetings. Anyone in the public could go. They did it joint with South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, as well as people from Texas, as well as feds and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is the interstate body. And they had did, it's about as good a stock assessment as any state management process can do. And it showed a clear reduction in, this, in, you know, in, in the population of these fish. And now this amendment, given the lawsuit by the commercial fishing industry, is the only way that we can enact any management measures, right? And, and interesting. Interesting. Um, this is the only way that we can enact management measures is through this process. Now, what we're seeing, what the commission may or may not pass on Thursday, Friday, um, is a two is kind of a let's call it a a, a quick amendment. It's going to take place for two years, and if you want to go into more of that, we can probably go into that more a little bit later. Um, but this process, this this is basically to kind of get in reductions right now so that we don't have bigger reductions down the line. This has kind of been complicated lately by the fact that we've actually had pretty good flounder fishing this year, right? I know, um, yeah. I know I was talking to you guys about this earlier, right? Yeah, I was, uh, I was actually going to bring that up after this. <laughs> yeah. All right, do you, want to, do you just want to talk about that now? Or yeah, before? let's talk about that now and, and maybe kind of the confusion between the fact that we have three different types of flounder here and, and, right. and, and that whole question there. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, um, so... I kind of, you know, this is kind of one of the things that really affects the way, you know, I know, you know, if, if people who follow fisheries in North Carolina, we have a, we have such an, a, we have such a diverse fishery here in this state. We have, we have all the northern species, we have all the southern species, we have access to so many of these offshore species, and that people are jumping in between fisheries all the time. So, you know, it's kind of easy when something goes away to kind of forget about it for a while. And I don't, I don't know if y'all, y'all would agree with me, but particularly over the last five years, our flounder fishing was, was pretty bad, right? It was not good, particularly internally. And it's definitely been decreasing over the last 20. I don't think anybody's going to tell me that we catch nearly as many fish and nearly as many flounder in the internal waters as we did 20 years ago. Um, but let's remember Hurricane Florence, okay? Who, who can't remember Hurricane Florence? Yeah, who can't remember Hurricane Florence? I, I mean, I'm still looking at the damage of it, right? Yeah. Awesome in my house. But with, <laughs> with Hurricane Florence, it knocked out all fishing effort to an incredible degree, right? And we've seen this with hurricanes in the past. I mean, this thing, recreational trips were down 80, 90%, right? I, I, up here, I, I, I had no hotel rooms to put clients in, right? We had the boat ramps were blocked, whatever. For, for September and October, our prime fall fishing months, there was almost no recreational pressure, no for higher pressure. The pound nets were knocked out. Guys weren't gill netting. People weren't gigging. The fish were whacked out. Were moved out, moved out by the drop in salinity and all the rainwater. So a lot more of them survive. Of course, there's more fish this year. There's always more fish after a hurricane. I love fishing in years after a hurricane, and and so, and, and that just isn't just for the southern flounder, which we're talking about. This is for the other species of flounder we catch in North Carolina as well. We have three species of flounder, and this is also something that really confuses the management here. Um, most of the fish you're going to catch, and you could catch these from, you know, New Bern and all the, you know, Alligator River and all the low salinity areas in North Carolina, all the way into the, you know, into the surf are southern flounder. They make up probably the bulk of our catch here in this state. And this is what this, this management measure, uh, you know, this amendment is, is managing. The other two species are what we kind of catch in the high salinity areas, as well as in, you know, offshore you know, to a much higher percentage. In fact, uh, Division of Marine Fisheries data, you know, kind of indicates that 97% of the recreational ocean catch is Gulf and summer flounder. Summer flounder are the species, they, they tend to be smaller here in North Carolina, where the extreme southernmost of their range, they've got a lot of, you know, you've got all those really distinct oscillated spots on them. But what really confuses everything is the Gulf flounder. Um, those are what many of us are predominantly catching on the near shore wrecks, as well as as well as in internal waters. I, I think I caught six or seven of them today in uh, in, in Core Sound. Um, they're the ones with three oscillated spots and a very round tail. Um, you know, and, and they're often keeper size. We're in the most northern extremes of their range. Um, actually, the world record was caught here in Carteret County, North Carolina. It was a seven pound two ounce fish. Uh, we routinely catch the Gulf flounder. You know, from you know. 
12 inches all the way through about four or five pounds. And, you know, it's pretty common to see them that size. And uh, for me, they're a predominant percentage of my catch here where I fish in Carter County. And I think that's what's confusing a lot of people from, 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 um, particularly in the angling communities, because so many of us fish for these guys out in the ocean, and we're having a particularly good year with those guys, right? So, Correct. gotcha. Well, um, you want to kind of jump into the history? Wasn't that kind of the next segment we wanted well, to move into, Billy? Did so, you have a question? so we kind of talked about that. So, my, I guess my question is this, man, because I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep up as much as possible. Uh, definitely not as educated as as Tom here is. But, you know, everybody is posting a ton of pictures of flounder. I mean, I see it all over social media. I see it everywhere. And everybody's like, oh, the flounder, flounder, flounder. They're doing so good. But, you know, it's kind of like that thing. I mean, I hate to bring up a mass shooting in because in, that's not what, you know, we're talking about here. But it's kind of the same principle. It's like a bunch of people get shot. It's a mass shooting. God forbid that ever happens again. I hate it. But then, yeah, everyone runs to the gun store and buys a bunch of guns because there might be legislation that prevents us gun owners from doing that. So is this the same situation that we're having over the last couple of months like the guys who probably maybe they're not even fishing for flounder but then they're going out and now everybody's going oh man we're catching so many flounder well yeah sure because you weren't targeting flounder before the talk of this amendment i mean that is probably not even uh-huh. super relevant but i feel like that's kind of happening because i've seen people that i follow for several years by living here who don't typically put flounder up and now it's like every picture is like everybody's just like stocking up a fear of like we're not gonna be able to do this um, <laughs> so yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that's kind of part of it, right? But okay. I also think there's more fish here. Okay. That, 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 that's plain and simple. Us fishermen, we're going to go fish for what's good, right? I know I do. I'm not going to speak for Judson, but, well, you know. Um, I like to fish for what's not biting. Yeah, well, you fish for what's not biting? <laughs> that's what I feel like. Sometimes. Who likes a challenge? <laughs> um, but that, that kind of goes back to the hurricane, right? Okay. And one of the big issues with our su- – so in the biology of southern flounder, these fish grow really quickly, okay? We're catching predominantly the female fish, which the males don't really get over 15 inches. And the females, which tend to be, you know, get much larger, those are going to be your bigger fish and a lot of your keepers, they um, they grow very, very fast. Bulk of our catches are going to be one- and two-year-old fish who are sexually immature. The biology of these fishes, these southern fauna will grow up in our marshes, they will live in the sounds for one one year, two years, three years, some of them even four years before they reach sexual maturity. At that point in time, they go out into the ocean, and that's where they, they live and they spawn. Now, we do know some fish return, but one of the big things the stock assessment showed, and which is, and it should be more than anecdotal, is our catches used to com, com, be comprised of a lot more fish that were older than three, four years old. There was a lot more big fish. A five pound flounder can be two years old, right? A six pounder can be two years old. Some of them can be much older. They have a, you know, they're like people. They grow at much, much, uh, uh, they grow at very, very, um, very different rates, right? You know, an example I like to use is I've, I've, I've worked with, um, you know, the scientific community, particularly on flounder for a long time. And I, take a lot of my carcasses to the division of marine fisheries to have them age them. And um, one of the past biologists, I think it was about five years old, well, I gave him a, I think I caught two southern flounder in the ocean that day, and I try to bring them all my carcasses from fish in the ocean to kind of get an eight, because the data from those is pretty important, because they're such a small component of ocean catch. And I think I brought, I remember I brought in a 17-inch fish and a 23-inch fish, which is about five pounds. And he aged both of them. He said, man, this is really interesting. The 17-inch fish was like six years old, and the 22-inch wow. fish was two and a half years old. Right? So it, showed a, it, showed a, it just shows a varying growth yeah, rate. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, you always think bigger fish, older fish. Yeah. What's that? I'm sorry? I said you always think bigger fish, older fish. That's, that's interesting that, that that's not necessarily the case. I mean, and you, and you can see this as, you know, obviously different species, but you see this in red drum. There's a lot of tag returns. Some of these fish that were tagged at, 36 inches long or caught 10 years later and they're 36 and a half inches long. Other fish are tagged at 37 and caught 10 years later and they're 50. Uh, you know, in right. some regard, they're just like people, whether female or whether male, they just kind of, some fish get bigger than others, right? Yeah. Um, just because though, but, but back to, you know, why why we're seeing such good catches this year. Um, first of all, I think, I, I personally up here, I'm seeing really good ocean catches. I'm seeing better inshore catches. I know I'm having better inshore catches. But they still pale in exist, you know. They still pale in comparison to what I was able to do ten years ago 
20 years ago, right? There's definitely still a lot less fish. I am so happy. I mean, I, I look at this and when I see us being able to go out and catch three or four flounder inside or being able to go out in the ocean and maybe get a three, four man limit of four fish, I mean, first of all, I think back to 2006, 2004, 2007, when I could reasonably, I could actually go out and get four, eight man, you know, four, uh, four or five man, five man limit of eight fish. I mean, that's going to be a lot harder to do today than what it is. But one of the is one of the things I bring up is that for those who are concerned that these management actions won't have any impact, well, look at what happened last year. We had a hurricane roll through, knocked out all the fishing effort, and all of a sudden we're catching more of them this year. So, right? so you I mean, recover. That means there's just more fish. You know, there's it's, there's more fish around, right? So more fish survived last year. Gotcha. So so are you saying so the hurricane and how long did that shut you guys down? Wreck guys in particular. Or everyone, I guess. How, what are you, a couple months? Is that what the timeline we're looking at? It was pretty nasty for, for two weeks, but the fishing was pretty pretty terrible for, for a while after that. Um, yeah, up here, I mean, if you look at, like, uh, fisheries, the, the state collection data, like uh, the Marine Recreational Information Program, the MREP, who goes out and surveys anglers, um, I think catches were uh, harvest, not harvest, effort, meaning how many trips were surveyed was way, way, way down, particularly in southeastern North Carolina. And that's, you know, um, that's a huge part of, um, you know, our, our fishing year in particular here. But it's also when the when the flounder do their fall migration, right? And so in my area, pound netting effort was way down. Most of them were knocked out in the storm, right? People weren't able to get them up in time. And they do, you know, and I'm not ragging on pound nets here. So, so hold on, hold on. You get a percentage of the catch. So if you don't catch them, there's going to be more around, right? So Yeah, so hold on a second. So I'm asking a timeline. So after the hurricane, how many months? Was it two months? Was it one month? I'm trying to get an idea of if, if we're going, hey, before the hurricane, the fishery for flounder, because that's what we're talking about, wasn't that great. Then we took X amount of time off, and now we feel like that gave – does it give flounder time enough to recover? I mean, is that the idea of this amendment to go, Hey, let's, let's stop fishing for these fish. And, and I'm not playing like devil's advocate or anything. I mean, I have my own, my own thoughts about, you know, the, the fishery and my own thoughts about my one year old fishing 20 years from now. So, I mean, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I'm about the fish. I think Judd and I both are about taking care of the, the fish, but just to try to understand it because that way it's like, hey, if, uh, if it computes to, okay, if we don't fish for these fish for six months or a year, this is what our fishery has the potential to look like. I think that's a huge yeah. win yeah. of understanding for, oh. for, the, for the guy like me who's out maybe fishing on the weekend, maybe once, twice a, you know, a week or month or whatever. You know, that's what I'm trying to get as a, like, maybe like a timeline. Not that you can say, hey, give it two months and we'll have 40% more flounder. I'm not saying that, but just a, a little insight on that. Let's talk a little bit about fisheries management. Um, first of all, like I mentioned before, the, our, our catch is compromised mostly of younger fish, right? It's compromised mostly of fish that are just a couple of years old. Okay. Now, one of the big issues in recent years was, was the introduction of some new science into the understanding of Southern flounder biology. Um, we always know, we always knew that there were, that the stock was much larger I'm trying to gather my words here, a way, way to think to explain this. One of the most important things that was discovered was that the Southern Flounder stock is not just a North Carolina stock. Okay. And so in Sue Wilmington, they did a, uh, in Dr. Fred Sharp's lab, it, they did a lot. I mean, he's on the Southern Flounder Advisory Committee. He's the chair. Um, one of the things they did, they did some genetic studies. And they did these big genetic studies of Southern Flounder and found that while they're found from North Carolina to Texas, they found that the, the South Atlantic population, which is found from, granted, North Carolina to about Central Florida, was one genetic population. And then the Gulf Coast was all one, you know, all the Gulf of Mexico was one, was one uh, genetic population. So since they're separate, right, they can look at these and they can tell, hey, North Carolina fish aren't just here to North Carolina. They're kind of a coastwide stock, right? They're all one genetic pool. So that means that we're getting contributions to the spawning stock from Florida, from Georgia, from South Carolina, from Florida, right? And so they're all spawning together. And you could actually make the argument pretty, pretty soundly 
that if we weren't getting contributions from those other states, we would have probably eradicated this stock wow. a few years ago, right? Now, what we should talk about to take this at a different level is that this stock is overfished, meaning we're removing too many fish, or overfishing is occurring, which means we're removing too many fish too many young fish from the population before they can reproduce. And the stock is overfished, meaning we don't have enough mature fish in, in, in the population, right? These fish don't necessarily live a long time. You know, um, you know, I, 10, 12 years is an old flounder. But we don't have, and this is, this is the, you know, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the catch that we can't, we can't look. This is the, this is the piece that we really need to look at is that, there are a lot less older, mature, spawning age fish in the stock, okay? And that's why we can't just lay off for six months on this fishery and expect it to be recovered forever. And that has to do with, you know, the age structure of this, this fishery. We're killing a bunch of young fish. Mm -hmm. We're not letting enough of them get old enough, right? And we've seen this in the past. We whack off, we have a hurricane roll through, oh man, the fishing's good the next year. We kill all of those fish whether it's recreationally or commercial, we're not letting them get old enough to spawn. And then we'll see kind of a, you know, it kind of, it kind of snowballs down from there. Does that make sense? I mean, I would yeah. actually make an argument. We've allowed hurricanes to manage this fishery for too long, right? I mean, we just let natural, natural weather events come in here and reduce effort. And it kind of just keeps this, this stock, um, you know, keeps this stock, um, just in good enough shape so it's not completely collapsed, right? Or I shouldn't say just in good enough shape, just in enough shape that it hasn't it hasn't collapsed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And we, we had a guy that commented, Andrew, he said the fishing in, in CB intercoastal waterway was fantastic mm -hmm. three weeks mm -hmm. after the hurricane, which which makes sense, like you're saying, because, you know, those fish hadn't seen any pressure for three weeks and you get out there and, and I, I, like you're saying, sh short term and long term, you see see that difference kind of play out. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, these fish have to run a gauntlet, man, in the fall. They 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 migrate, particularly up here. I don't know if you guys have fished up my way here. Yeah. I mean, and it's I'm amazed any any of these fish can actually make their spawning run when they when they kind of move from the western part of the sound in October to go towards the ocean to to go offshore and spawn. They've got to get past all of our hook and line. They've got to get past gigs. They've got to get past the gill net effort. They got to get past the pound net effort. And they've got to make their way through the inlets to, to get out there, right? And mm -hmm. it's <laughs> between all of us, it's, you know, we're all after these guys, right? right. And so we have, we have a lot of different stakeholders in this fishery, and we're harvesting a lot of these fish, right? And you come up here and you kind of see the effort. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, so. it is. So, okay, so let's talk about this for a minute. I, I think this is very interesting. So mm -hmm. we're, we're putting the pressure on them. And so I think everybody on this call is, um, you know, recreation you know, fishermen for sure. So let's talk about how many do you know? I mean, I, maybe I'm asking you numbers you don't know. And, and once again, I didn't research this at all. I was going to go at it like, hey, I'm going to research. I'm going to know what I'm talking about. And I thought, you know what? I don't know what I'm talking about. So why try to fake it at the last minute? <laughs> like just be a dodo and come in here and ask questions because I, these are the questions I see. So what is the, the commercial fishermen? Like how many commercial fishermen are registered in the state of North Carolina? Do you know the answer to that? Um, I mean, keep in mind, we have a lot of different fisheries, right? I think we have somewhere around 4,000 active commercial fishermen. Um, so that's commercial. I'm sorry. I meant recreation. But that, that, you know, but we've got crappers and longliners and, you know, tuna fishermen and, you know, oystermen and, you know, you got people, you know what I mean? We have a ton of different fisheries that don't interact with yeah, Southern Flounder. Yeah. So what about recreational? Sorry. I'm, I'm talking about recreational first. Then we can jump into commercial. So recreational fishermen, roughly how many do you, how many, I can probably look it up really quick. I mean, to see how many, but hundreds of thousands, put it that way. Hundreds yeah, of so. thousands. Gotcha. So here's my question, I guess. And, and I'm, you know, not, and this is the questions that I hear a lot just through the community of talking to people. It's like, okay, so we shut down this fishery, um, and to, to repopulate it. Right. And then, mm -hmm. so, so the rec guys, so say hundreds of, say 300,000 rec, you know, recreational fishermen are no longer pulling in flounder. One, I would be maybe hard pressed to know any guy who's going out every day and pulling in for these fish. But then what, you know, what does that look like? So what, what kind of impact would that make? I mean, is there a study of like, cause I know like I'm not asked unless I get approached by somebody at the dock of like, Hey, how many fish you catch? How big were they? You know, taking those surveys. 
Is there any type of study on the recreational side of how many fish we're actually harvesting as, you know, hundreds of thousands of people with our fishing license? Yeah. And then that's, that's your dockside survey, right? I mean, yeah, and yes, yeah. you, we, remember we have recreational fishermen are a lot of people with small catches. Okay. Yeah. And you know, us for hire fishermen or guides, we're, we're interviewed separately and it's not perfect. It's estimates. Um, you know, I would like to see and have advocated for better data collection on the for hire sector as well as in the recreational sector. But these are the, when they interview you, it's estimates. And I, I hear a lot of fishermen tell me, Oh, Hey, I've never been interviewed before. Well, guys, there's hundreds of thousands of you, you know, it doesn't just because you haven't been interviewed doesn't mean the whole program is ridiculous or doesn't work. Um, but there's an extraordinary amount of studies about, you know, there's a lot of data that estimates this, this catch, right? And one, there's also a lot of studies based on what our discard level is. And a discard is a fish that we throw back and it dies, regardless of whether it was undersized or the season was closed or we hooked it badly or didn't want to keep it. That's a discard. And that's been a big concern here in the recreational fishery is that when we close it, we're still going to have discards. Just yeah. like other fish, just like commercial fisheries. Will that brings that brings up the, uh, Jason on here on the on the live feed said, I don't believe wrecks are taking too many fish. I've heard numbers of what commercial harvest in a day. No comparison. And we, we talked about this last week. And and I think that it's not a, a matter now of of pointing fingers at, at one side or the other. It's more so the fact of like, all right, we're in a place where yeah. this fishery is struggling and any fish taken out of the water, no matter how many or how few is is, is going to be damaging to the stock so what, what what's what's kind of your opinion on, on that side um so if you asked me that five years ago i would have been more inclined to agree with it okay and and i and i do believe you know recreational we harvest about 30 percent of the southern flounder in the state of north carolina it's about 30 recreational and about 70 commercial and, and so and, and, yes so, we do have a smaller piece of the pie but we're talking about a stock that in order to recover for long-term viability we need to reduce harvest across the board by 72%. That yeah. is an unbelievable number. That's about as bad a stock assessment as you can have, right? Yeah. This is a stock this is a this is a stock in which a moratorium is on the table, okay? That's that's that 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 that, that should, you know, or moratorium has been discussed, right? That should tell you you have a serious problem. With something that needs to be reduced that far, I don't really believe personally that the recreational community shares, shares. Um, I don't believe that we share the blame in this over harvest, but we're at a point that we have to, we, we have to have, put it this way, we're at a point that we have to take big reductions to in order to rebuild this fishery in, in, you know, within a 10 year timeline, which is what this kind of amendment starts us on the, on the track to do. Right. Yeah. So, does that make sense? Yeah, man, that, that makes sense. And, and so you're saying, based on study, based on research, that, that rec guys probably take about 30% of the catch. And so mm -hmm. you got another 70%. So is that 70% number based off of what commercial, and maybe we'll get in a little com commercial fishermen here. I mean, and, and really, I wish I could have found somebody that, that could have came on the show from the commercial side, because I feel like that's the fairest way to have the conversation. But I couldn't find somebody that, um, you know, that I personally know or, or was in my close friend circle so quickly to come on and have a, a good conversation that brings us together, not rips us apart. So, so based on that 70% number, is, is are commercial guys are they ask like more questions more often or they gotta like put in in logs like what's the process for those guys how do we come up with this number or is it just something we're pulling out of the air and making assumptions how does that work in the management system while there are issues with commercial data collection and i don't think we need to get into that um our commercial fishing community reports all harvest on trip tickets Okay. Um, or, well, the, the, you know, fishermen catch it, they sell it to a dealer, the dealer records the fish and, 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 and records the fish catch and also and sends that to the, uh, and all of that data goes to the division of fisheries. That's what their catch harvest is put on. It's pretty darn good. Okay. It's not perfect. There are issues. Um, sure. In, you know, in any system. See, how many, I mean, I know we all know guys which have commercial licenses that go out to, to gig, you know, past the recreational limit, right? That, that tends to be one of the issues where where data collection is, is a problem, right? People who are not using the licenses as they are intended to be used. They're not breaking the law, but they're just using it differently and the fish aren't getting recorded. But that's how commercial data is collected, okay? And as far as recreational data, we talked about that. It's based off of these catch estimates. And like I say, you know, people like to point out there's big margins of error and it's not perfect and they're just estimates. Uh, but when you look at MRAPs nationwide, 
it works pretty good. We manage by it. It does a pretty good job. Yeah. So, you know, it's got a pretty good track record, particularly when, you know, when there's, you know, when the, when the state does it, you know, when your, your management body does its job and, and, and reduces harvest like you're supposed to work or so forth or, or manage it at an appropriate level. So. Yeah, well, and I appreciate what you said there, uh, even about commercial guys. And once again, I'm not here to to take up for anybody. I'm I'm just here to get more information. I'm just curious and have I've had a week to think about this and kind of process it. Um, so, so with the with these commercial numbers, I, I love what you said because you said within the confines of the law, they're playing by the rules. So obviously that's where this amendment comes in. Uh, so a couple questions on our on our Facebook page that are coming in is. Is this going to close? Is this is this? Um, I guess is it a pitch to close for both commercial and rec? That I think. That, I mean, I was going to ask that question anyway, so maybe this is time to ask it since we're kind of talking about both here. Okay. So remember, we talked about earlier that this amendment was put into place as a management measure, the short-term amendment, let's call it, because of the lawsuit by the commercial and. This prevented the director gotcha. of marine fisheries from issuing a proclamation or or implementing short-term management measures to try to reduce harvest while we got a stock assessment. So we have spent the last three years knowing that we had a problem. And while fishing is pretty good this year for flounder, let me point out it, it was not good last year. It was not good the year before that either, right? Um, so we during this amendment, this is a two-year timeline. And we are race, they are racing clock. They did an emergency uh, Marine Fisheries Commission meeting in May to get this, to get this approval um, to get. So basically, we go through this uh, advisory, advisory panel process. The commission um, has a meeting to decide to send the amendment out for public comment. You have a 30 day public comment meeting, public comment session. And then the commission has to take it up and approve it. Right. Um, is to take it up and approve it, and then they vote on it for final approval later, right? So we've had we've had so many different meetings on this. I think this will be our third Marine Fisheries Commission meeting over this specific amendment. Now, what this amendment does is not what it's going to look like in 2020. Okay, so what this amendment does is trying to reach 72% reduction in 2019. Okay. So us recreationals, we catch most of our fish in two two different periods. We catch them in the summer. And we catch a little bump there in the fall, like, you know, late September through October, right? When, when the fish are migrating and we're all trout fishing and drum fishing and surf fishing and catching a few of them. Um, so being that it's been open for us all summer long, we've already probably, I'm not going to say we, we probably caught more than our, you know, um, we, it, I don't want to speculate, but uh, being that it's been open all summer, we can't afford to have it open another day to bid reductions on our side of things, right? Gotcha. Now, the commercial community catches most of their fish in the fall. Most of that catch comes through gillnets, and about an equal proportion, maybe less, maybe more, depending on the year, comes from the pound net fishery. Gigging is a distant third. And the majority of that harvest is in you know, mid-September through mid-November, mid right? Okay. And so this is what their season is based on. So a lot of people are saying, well, you know, you're going to close it for recreationals and you're going to open it for commercials. Well, that's not really true. You know, we have we're going to have different seasons. And I know people have issues with that, but that's just kind of how the math shakes out, guys. Right now, 2000, had we been able to approve this before 2019, um, it would look like hopefully what it would in 2020, which would be about a 45 day recreational season. I, I can't remember the dates off the top of my head, but it's like August to the end of September. OK. And then the commercial season is mid-September through late October, depending on uh, depending on which region of the state you're in, right? Since the fish migrate kind of from the northern realm to the southern realm, we kind of catch them at different times in the state. And we're a big state with a lot of coastline, right? Mm, Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Now, um, but anyway, do you have any uh, – don't, don't let me ramble on. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. So, uh, so I do have a question for you. So okay. I, I want to talk about that. So, so – so you say, hey, we're, we're going to close this down for rec guys. And, and then I agree it's our responsibility to take care of the resource. I mean, I'm down for that. I mean, I'm totally down for that. To, you know, it's, it's definitely our responsibility. I, I feel like in any situation, if we're talking about fish or if we're talking about landfills or whatever, it's our responsibility as humans to take care of the planet we live on and the things that we've been blessed enough to have. So 
I'm with you on that. But here's the part where I'm I'm kind of cloudy in this one because I don't understand anything about recreation or about commercial fishermen fishing. So l- explain to me if you don't care, and I think you know way more about it. And if you don't, if you don't, just say hey, I don't. No no reason to to pander on it if we don't have to. But but what is exactly a gill net? How does it work? Because this is, if I ask a dozen recreational fishermen, what do you think needs to happen to to this uh, fishery for to make flounder better? They go, get rid of gill nets. If I yeah. ask someone outside of this state, what do you think needs to happen to protect our fishery? It's get rid of gill nets. So it's like kind of the same ringing, and you know, and I and I get it, man. And I am for people just as much as I am for anything else. So I don't want to. And we talked about this before the show. I don't want to beat up on commercial guys. I don't want to beat up on everybody's going to make a living. I own a t-shirt business. I get it that that t-shirt ink is not the greatest for the environment. And I try to, you know, do that and do water base ink as much as I can. I get it. But at the same time, I got to feed my family. So what what does the gill net do? Why, are, why is everybody so pissed off about it? I literally am asking this question because I don't know anything about it. And, and once you tell me that, I got another question for you. Cause I think I know what it is, okay. but I didn't do any research. So I'm going to so let you Let's go. talk about, I'm going to, um, we're going to talk about a little bit. So North Carolina, as far as Southern flounder commercial harvest, harvests 98.52% of all commercial flounder in the Southern Atlantic. Okay. So that concludes Florida through North Carolina where Southern flounder are found. We are 98.52% of the harvest. Big, wow. right? We have wow. the biggest commercial fishery. We have one of the biggest, um, probably as we have the biggest uh, southern flounder commercial fishery by far, um, from North Carolina to Texas. I think if you look at it overall, it's about you know when you throw in the uh, the Gulf in there, it's like you know ninety some percent or eighty high eighties. I can't remember. Now the gillnet fishery, we're the only state, we're the only southeastern state with any sort of measurable gillnet fishery anymore for any species, right? Now, what I will say is we have dozens of gillnet fisheries in North Carolina. Many of them are sustainable. Many of them don't cause problems. Many of them, I think, should exist in this state for a long period of time. Now, when it comes to the flounder fishery, that's a different story. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you how bad it is, but I will tell you how it works. So it's called a large mesh fishery. And these are um, kind of the, 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 the gill nets you're going to see out in the marsh. Um, guys go out and um, it's pretty, I, I don't want to, I hesitate to use heavily regulated, but they have a lot more regulations now in the fishery than they did 20 years ago. Um, y- you know, in my area, in your area, they can use about a thousand yards of net. Okay. Um, that's a lot of net. Guys go out and they drop it in the marsh parallel to the shoreline for the most part. And it's set, um, it's kind of set slack on the bottom. And they use that to catch mostly, you know, it's targeting southern flounder, but it catches the vast majority of, of commercially caught red drum in the state. It's where they also catch a lot of, uh, you know, sheep's head and black drum and a lot of other things. Um, that's, you know, that fishery also catches a lot of sea turtles. That's why we have this really expensive observing program through the state of North Carolina, which counts the amount of turtles that these guys catch. Um, cost the state, you know, up several hundred thousand dollars, uh, up to a million dollars a year to observe this fishery. Um, and that's the state employees going out and actually counting the turtles that they catch, um, as well as, you know, endangered sturgeon. So they catch a lot of endangered species as well. Right. And it's the bulk of our flounder harvest in the state. It's typically not always, but typically the majority of the commercial flounder catches through, through these gill nuts. Right. And I think a lot of people's problems with them and, you know, my personal problems with them is that they just catch so many other species. They catch so many red drum yeah. and so on and so forth. Right. Now the pound net fishery is... You're going to see this fishery it tends to be mostly really far in the eastern part of the state. It's uh, found, you know, um, you see a lot of them in Core Sound, off of Hat- Hatteras, Ochre Croak, um, Cedar Island area, all the way up into the Albemarle Sound, um, kind of in, you know, to uh, eastern Dare County. The way they work is they're, they're a fish trap, essentially, right? If you go out in the marsh now, you're going to see these long lines of stakes. Uh, this fishery is only really effective in the fall. Um, basically, um, they put out these rope mesh, they really thick mesh uh, panels. The fish hit the panel, they swim down it like it's a fence, and they go into what's essentially a corral, right? Okay. And they're in there, it's alive. The fishermen go out there, they pull up the pound, they can pull out the live fish, they can throw back the undersized ones. It's an extremely clean fishery. Now, it's very effective at catching flounder, so it's not that to say we can't regulate it, but it's a very, very clean fishery. It has very little dead bycatch let me put it that way so 
Okay, so so that type of fishing, uh, I'm, and I'm with you, man. I like it. I mean, like the sound of it is like, oh, okay, this sounds like some, you know, I mean, I see people in different river fishing this way. Like up in, you know, you watch TV, you watch Alaska guys. I mean, they're creating these corrals where they're not killing every fish. So, okay, so I'm a wreck guy. I say, okay, cool. I'm, I'm down with the closer, the closure of the flounder fishing. And then, then you said a thousand yards of gill net. Is that right? A yeah, thousand? Up in the Noose River to the Albemarle, they can set 2,000 yards. So, dude, we're talking, I mean, this is, this is crazy. We're talking three, a mile of net. We're talking about three football fields of net that just crush fish. Like, how in the hell am I a wreck guy? And sorry, I'm not, I'm not like, football fields how, try am 10. I, how is my, four flounder a month going to uh, compete with that like i mean and i get it i'm down i'm down with the closure i'm with you but i'm going man there's got to be something else huh is there like a i mean but here's the thing i'm on both sides of the fence because i'm like this sucks because that is crazy to put that amount of net out and kill everything coming into it but it's also stinks because you're talking about guys who've been in this business for 50 years and that's how they make a living so what yes, it's in, in summer like that and some are not. I know also a lot of guys that get into it because that you know gillnet mesh is relatively cheap. Gotcha. You can do a small yeah, boat. It's a, it, it's a fishery you can get into to make some extra money on the side. And I see a lot of that up my way, right? Yeah. But that's not all commercial fishermen. I have a lot of friends who are in the commercial industry who I respect tremendously. And you know, particularly with my involvement kind of in fisheries on the federal level, I enjoy my um, interactions with the commercial community, uh, honestly, a lot more than I do aspects of the recreational community. But now, as far back to to nets, um, man, you know, <laughs> trying to gather my words pretty carefully here, but, I um, hold on, hold on a second. I had Judson's mic down. He had to step out for just a second, but he just had a question. I got it turned back up. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Ask sorry. Sorry about that. I was just going to say, as you're talking about this, also kind of go into how long flounder, redfish, turtles, other things like that live in these nets once they're captured. Um, there are so many studies on large mesh flounder net bycatch mortality, meaning what kind of, how quickly the bycatch, bycatch lives and dies, right? Um, it's pretty bad. Okay. And a lot of these fish also die if you catch an undersized one and throw them back. Man. You, 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 you're putting out this net often in 80 degree water and whether, regardless of species, the mortality is very, very, very high. It's much higher with some species. Bluefish, red drum, right, are going to die much faster than, say, a flounder. And actually, a lot of the flounder caught are, are tend to be caught alive, from my experience. Um, not all of them, right? And a lot of them get, you know, nibbled on by crabs in this hot water. Um, but, yeah, yeah, the, to put it that way, mortality is very, very high. And a lot of this mm. stuff doesn't live for very long. Now, it's also, a, I call it a passive fishery because guys put this stuff the way it's fish is they put the, they don't tend to they don't attend the net right most guys put it out to you know they go out and they drop it at dusk they dry, they come and get it you know the next morning at 5 5 a.m right so it sits out there for anywhere between 6 and 10 12 hours right and so some of those fish they're going to pull in are already going to be dead some are still going to be alive depending on when they caught on it um uh, my experience has been a lot of the the non-flounder bycatch is deceased period yeah right so, so, well, and I guess we can't, you know, I mean, it's probably not our position to answer that on this show, but you know, I, I do think it stinks, man. Cause and like I said, I'd love to talk to a, a commercial fisherman who, who does these nets and, and get some more insight on it before I'm like, cause I am a business guy, man. I, and I love people and I love opportunity. I love America. I love where we live and the opportunity that we have. And so it stinks. Like I'm, I'm like yeah. literally thinking about a thousand yards of net, killing everything that comes into it sick in my stomach but then i'm also on the other side going golly man this is people's livelihood For where's sure. the technology or or the advancement like where's the investment of technology to go hey let's reinvest into our, our fishing industry let's reinvest into the commercial industry and and take care of both i think we need to remember too that that we can't point our fingers at sure the commercial side of things because sure. it's really the state and it's it's what's allowed and, and people allowed. are taking advantage yeah. of a job opportunity that's out there and the ability Absolutely. to be able to go set a thousand yards gill net and the ability to set a pound net and, and they're gonna make that. a living man they're gonna feed their exactly. families too exactly. it sucks. so wow just like me just like judd you know i mean like, yeah. so here's the thing you talk about reinventing it okay we don't need to do that it's already there okay um the gig fishery 
is a very clean fishery. It's a very hot topic on our chat room right now, by the way. I, I, I understand. I went out for a second. What was that? There's a lot we can talk about that, but the gig fishery, particularly commercial, does not have any bycatch. And you have to go out there and you have to and you can work. You have to work pretty hard to be able to catch the fish that you do, right? Now, I also hear a lot of comments from people that there's a lot more recreational gigging now than there used to be. I actually really disagree with that. Um, I've lived in Carteret County most of my life. And while there are, you know, I do see a lot of people gigging out here. People, it's it's a fun thing to do. You go out and you put your lights on your boat and you get to see a bunch of cool stuff. Maybe it's, you know, it's probably the most effective way to go out and catch a few flounder for dinner now. Spear a few flounder for dinner. Um, but man, golly, there was a bunch of people flounder digging 20 years ago. There were so many nights you couldn't even find a boat, you know, a, 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 a parking spot at the ramp at night. Um, that's a little anecdotal, but that's definitely a lot of people share that opinion of mine. But, but as far, but talking about it commercially, when we're talking about the problems with these bycatch oriented fisheries, there is no bycatch with the gigging fishery, right? The pound net fishery, while it's seasonal, can catch a lot more fish than it does now probably but also can be more effectively managed right sure, and yeah. it's also a clean fishery so when we talk about needing more technology man it's already there do you know hook and line is a is a legal commercial gear for flounder so you can hook and line flounder in the state we don't need to reinvent it we just need to figure out how to more effectively manage it and to kind of like tend to go directly into another topic this amendment that the marine fisheries commission putting forth Guys, this is not perfect. I think they should pass it because we need to do right by the resource and start recovering this fishery before we're looking at an 82% reduction or a moratorium or something even worse, yeah. right? I mean, if we don't have a hurricane this year and all this effort stays in there, I don't think things are going to look too good next year. You know, we're just harvesting a bunch of two-year-old fish like we've said multiple times. Now, as far as this amendment particularly, the reason it sucks is the Division of Marine Fisheries, and I am not, and I don't disagree with this is how they put things. They put they tend to put out positions which are fair across the board. They're not fair economically, sure. but they tend to do an equal cut to all sectors that don't that don't single anybody out, right? And what that means is everybody gets screwed, okay? Mm. And some people more than others. What we discussed on the Flounder Advisory Committee, which was the big deal, is now that everybody has a fall season, this really hurts the gig fishery. The reason it hurts them is those guys want to gig in the summer, okay? Yeah. When they make really good money, when those they, they, some of my friends get like eight dollars a pound commercially, when particularly when the net fisheries close, they're the only game in town, right? And they wanted it open in the summer. Well, guess what? When you have a fair season, when everybody's open at the same time, they're going to be competing with all the catch from the pound net and the gill net fishery. It's going to lower prices a lot, right? Mm. The pound net fishery is going to be really hurt by this because they have a lot of capital investment in this fishery. Those pound nets are expensive. A lot of these pounds, I mean, a lot of these fishermen have thirty, forty thousand dollars in their setups. Now, while they may, you know, they, you know, they can make considerably more than that in a short period of time. Um, you, you, with such a capital investment, if they're cut to the short season, a lot of these guys aren't going to be able to afford to recoup that, you know, their yearly capital, their yearly capital. So they're not going to be able to do it in the same capacity. Right. And that's why I worry about those guys that were kind of pigeonholing, um, we're pigeonholing these other more viable, I should say, more sustainable commercial fisheries to accommodate the gillnet fishery. Right. And when it comes to the recreational fishery, y'all, we're worth a lot of money. Um, our economic impact is so many times greater than any other any other fishery in the state, right? I mean, we're looking at, we've got like a 1.7, you know, our all saltwater fishing in the state is a 1.6, 1.7 billion dollar industry, okay? Wow. And, uh, and flounder is, you know, it's obviously a big component of that. It's worth many, many, many millions of dollars. And I don't want to say, I don't want to sit here and talk about how much more valuable we are in the commercial fishery, because that is not an excuse to get rid of one. Because I don't know about y'all, I still want to be able to go to my favorite restaurants here in Carter County. Yeah, and be able to absolutely. Flounder, right? So, yeah. I mean, I love flounder. I like to catch them and eat them. I like to buy them in restaurants. I like, I want my customers to be able to get them. I just want that to be available in the future. And I also just want to be able to be that we can, you know, we can say that, wow, these fish were caught sustainably. Right. Yeah. So I think that's good, man. So I, I have another question for you. And dude, I'm sorry, Judson, if you, if you got a question, hey, bro, I'm enjoying just sitting I'm, here listening. I'm Billy's just firing like, the questions. I'm just so, I mean, it, because here's the thing, if, if you don't have something, it, 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 and here's my big question, I guess, I mean, big question, little question, whatever. 
So if flounder's off the menu. What mm-hmm. is on the menu? What takes the hit on the chin? What's the next? So what's, what's the? I mean, that's a good question. I feel like because I feel like okay, we're not targeting. We're still going to eat commercial. Honestly, there will right? still be plenty of flounder on the menu. Okay. No, um, no, 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 no. I'm saying this season's closed. Yeah. What takes there'll a hit to the chin? Lots of flounder to eat because um, the summer flounder fishery, which is a federally managed fishery, right? That these fish are found basically from Massachusetts through North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina has one of the biggest quota shares of the state. Um, our, our trawl fleet. Now we used to these fish have kind of moved farther north due to climate change and a lot of other variables. But the fishery is in pretty darn good shape and it's very well managed. Um, we land hundreds and thousands of pounds more than our southern flounder catch here. So, right here in Beaufort, North Carolina, a lot of it comes through. So, so that's not my that's question. Chance summer flounder will, will still be available. In fact, you guys, when you go to the restaurant, you're eating summer flounder a lot of the time. Hey, Tom, oh, Tom, yeah. don't, I don't mean to interrupt you. That's not my question. I'm not worried about the. I'm, I'm not worried about the restaurants. I'm worried about. So I'm not. You used oh, a tricky oh, word there, I, menu. I, I did. I said <laughs> menu, and I apologize for that. I, that wasn't. I mean, I I understand what you're saying there, and that's great. I asked now, a different like, question. So, but, <laughs> but still a good answer. No, it was still answer. a great answer. Yeah, it was still still a great answer, but. So for recreational guys, we still want to go out there and catch something and, and keep something. And so I feel like there's going to be other fish in this fishery that are going to feel the pressure. Is that yeah. yes or no? Like, what's your thoughts on I, that? Absolutely, man. And this is a big concern of mine. Okay. This is an excuse to like, just lay back on flounder and, and do nothing. I'm worried about sheep's head in particular. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot more pressure on those species. If you look at the age structure of those fish, what I, I don't think a lot of people realize is I talked to friends of mine who are biologists. They've done a, a lot of aging of these fish. Those five, six pound sheep's head can be 15, 20 years old. Wow. That's that the, you know, that is, that's, 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 that's troubling. Right. Um, I, 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 as far as like more targeting of some of the offshore species, I, I think that's, you got to have the money and the time and the ability to be able to do that. Um, but inshore, that's what I really worry about. And I do worry about more people going and trying to harvest drum and, you know, just putting more pressure on some of our other stocks, which I think you and I could argue could be in better shape than they are. Right. Mm -hmm. And, or like trout, which are just variable based on how heavy the, how, um, what would you say? Like how harsh our winters have been. Right. So, um, if they're not available, we, yeah, definitely a concern. So, but I think this is a good time to bring up is as far as flounder. One of the things that I really hope the Marine Fisheries Commission does, it's been talked about at length, both online as well at the past meetings, is that our ocean fishery, right? The division data, division marine fisheries data, 97% of those fish are Gulf and summer flounder. They're not southern flounder. They do not need to take that fishery away from us, okay? just because they don't think we're smart enough to you know to identify the other species now it can be really hard to identify them but we've had different size limits in the past for the ocean versus internally um i think that that fishery needs to stay open particularly since biologically and statistically you can't argue otherwise our impact on the southern flounder fishery like if they come out and they say you can you can possess four flounder in the ocean you know per person that's great. I think that they definitely need to do that. And I hope that they continue that conversation like they had. So, awesome, man. well, Tom, I, I think it's been great, dude. And you know, there's some people on the, on the chat here and you know, whatever we run a, we, we run a social media, Facebook live show and a podcast and, um, you know, got some people trolling, got some, got some, got some keyboard warriors over there. So, um, I won't give them their two seconds of fame. I won't shame them publicly, even though they, they're not even worth that. I, and I apologize to anybody else that we're a family friendly show. And you got people on here who are acting the way they are. It's pretty sad, man. Pretty sad world. Because I think once again, we're trying to come together and really have a good conversation on both sides. And a mature do, conversation. And we don't have all the answers, man. I mean, I, don't, I haven't met one person that says like, hey, I have all the answers. Actually, the best the best answer that I, well, I won't even say that because it's not <laughs> even the best answer. So um, I, I don't really have any more questions. I mean, I know I've kind of, I don't, didn't mean like hammer you. Hopefully you didn't feel that I was like attacking it, the subject. I was just trying to get a better understanding and really give people that, you know, higher macro level understanding of what is really going on. How does this amendment affect the whole industry, not just the rec guy, not just the commercial guy? Um, and so I think you did a, a fantastic job of, of that. So I, I don't like have any more questions. So Justin, if you got anything, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I want people to understand who are listening that 
this amendment, assuming the commission passes it this Thursday, Friday, is that we're going to immediately start working on another amendment. This is like a short term, two year uh, measure. Okay. And so immediately, as soon as this goes, as, as this um, amendment is stated, the, the advisory committee, as well as the commission is going to start working on a, on a long term amendment that's going to take place for the next five years. Hopefully that's going to have more, I don't want to use stricter, right? It's still going to be based, you know, along a lot of the same data, but it should be able to implement a lot of different management stuff, not this kind of like universal season for everybody that's really hurting a lot of people more than it should, right? Okay. And a, a second thing is, is a friend, a, a acquaintance of mine posted a really nice thing on my Facebook page today. And he said, you know, I don't agree with you on a lot of things, Tom, but um, I really like talking to you about it because, you know, it's, it's nothing personal and, you know, we learn something from each other. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I think that that's one of the most important things. And one of the things I like about the fisheries management process, it's, well, it may be, you know, kind of people button heads to it to, with each other. In the end, we just all have to learn to kind of agree and disagree and realize that we just kind of represent slightly different factions, right? Like I don't hold a lot of people's views against them personally, people hold them against me, but, um, you know, we the, the, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Right. So and I just want exactly. to hope for those trolls out there kind of, kind of listen to what I'm saying here. So. <laughs> it's just, it's just, you know, if somebody's passionate about something and they invest their, their time and their life into it, it, you should respect their opinion, whether you agree with yeah, it or not. Man, you know? absolutely. So whether, whether you a hundred percent agree with it or hundred percent disagree with it, it's their passion. It's their desire. And, and they've got the right to believe what they want to believe. And if you don't believe it, then then believe what you want to believe. But don't be a jerk about it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, man. Get involved in the fisheries process. All these meetings are public. Come to the advisory committee yep. meeting. Give public comment. Come to the commission meetings. I mean, people act like this stuff's been going on for two years. This isn't, you know, coming out of nowhere. It's been yeah. going on for a lot longer for two years. The more stakeholders we have involved, and actually the more of us who get to know and talk to each other, it's kind of the more sane and helpful it is, right? So I encourage people to get involved in the process and do it long term, not just something every, you know, just every once in a while, right? If this is really means something to you, get involved in it. So. Yeah. And I think we have to, if we're really going, and, and you know, I know there's a lot of people that are commenting and doing whatever. And we, we knew this was going to be a fun show, an interesting <laughs> show. And I always want to challenge everybody that's watching this to really think about, to, you know, I just bought my son or, or his grandparents bought him for his birthday. I have a one-year-old and, and we bought his lifetime fishing license. And so, you know, part of doing this, um, you know, doing Eastern Current is really to to make sure that 20 years from now when he decides to do whatever that, you know, he's got his lifetime license, man. I love to take him and go flounder fishing and enjoy that. And if he decides to, to make money at that as a, co a commercial fisherman or a recreational fisherman, uh, if that's a path that he decides to do, I'm not in that industry, but, you know, living on the water, that seems like a really popular and, uh, you know, successful thing to do here. I want that option for him. And so I think for a lot of people who we're all looking here, how does this affect me now? But we have to look long term and go, how does this affect the generations behind me? And if you've been in the commercial business or the recreational business for decades and decades and decades, how do you keep that legacy alive by making minor adjustments through the way? And I think that's what we're talking about. We're in the big scheme of life and in the big scheme of fishing. We're talking minor adjustments to make major to get major results in a positive manner. If I Help fishermen healthy fisheries take care of their fishermen that's right good. you can't have fisheries without the fish that's awesome man well 100%. tom if you don't have anything else i think we're good man i i feel so much more as well. educated and enlightened about the whole topic i feel way more comfortable to say hey i'm, I'm for this closure i'm i can have a more educated conversation to to people out in public and say hey here's you know here's what we're doing here's how we're doing it um, and if we can all just come together and, and, and figure that, and even if in, in our differences, so, you know, we're all going to be different. So, uh, but no sense in, in getting all wild about it. Like just go on your merry way. If you don't agree with each other. <laughs> so, absolutely. So, cool. Absolutely. Man. Well, it's great having me on guys. I, I hope that we all learned something and I love talking about this. I probably like talking about it too much. So maybe next time we can just talk about skitter or something. Fishing. <laughs> we're, gonna yeah, we're talking about top water. We're gonna, Something I feel a little more comfortable talking about. Yeah, man, we'd love to have you back on the show. Talk about your business. Talk about you know what, what you got going on and 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 do some things like that. But just in case anybody's listening, they they're up in your area, they want to go fishing with you. How do they get in touch with you? They go to my website, waterdogguideservice.com, and also find me at, uh, with, with the, basically the same handle on Instagram as well as Facebook. So, um, But I'm up here in Beaufort, North Carolina. I've been doing it for 17 years. Man, Happy awesome. to take anybody. Awesome. If anybody has any questions about flounder, 
reach out to me, man. Happy to talk about it. Email. Thank you so yes. much, man. And, 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 oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was just going to say if people, so what does this next two or three days of meetings look like? Is Can people be involved? Is it too late? I mean, I know we're having the conversation late, but this show, this is the 11th episode of this mm-hmm. show. So we didn't feel like episode one, we should come out firing <laughs> on all cylinders. So, well, you know, issues are controversial when people don't talk about them. So I don't believe they're that, they're, they're, you know, this is just the way of life. And I think that it's helpful to talk about these type of conversations. And I hope you have, you know, some commercial dudes come and talk about this too. Sure. Now, as far as this yeah. process, um, the Marine Fisheries Commission meeting is taking place in Raleigh. It's a quarterly meeting. So, um, you know, usually the, the three of the meetings per year tend to be on the coast. Um, one of them, not every year, but tends to be in Raleigh. It's this meeting. Um, it takes place on when, either public comment session on Wednesday night as well as Thursday morning. So if you want to go give public comment, you can do that. Um, you can find on Division Marine Fisheries, um, you know, their their webpage there. I don't have the details in front of me. Um, and I believe looking at the agenda, I want to say the flounder vote is going to be Friday. Last I looked at it. I could see it. I think I'm pretty sure it's the Friday. I'm not sure. So a public comment Thursday morning and Friday evening. So awesome. people want to go to a conference. And assuming they pass it and the advisory committee is still working, we should have tons of meetings as we work into a uh, kind of a long-term uh, plan here over the next two years. So there's plenty of opportunities to say your piece and get, make public comment. Gotcha. Lots, lots of opportunities. Well, so. well, I have another question for you. So I want to I want to give a shout out to, um, or not a shout out, but uh, Fisherman's Post posted something. No matter what, you know, the because they have a tournament coming up this weekend. And so um, they posted on their Instagram that there's like a 48 hour window if this decision comes. So it's not effective immediately. Is that is that correct in saying that, that there's a 48 hour and I think they're still going to do their um, okay. tournament there? Can you that, talk about that just that, for a couple seconds? That's a good question. So let's assume that the commission passes this on Friday. Remember, this is not a total closure we're going to be having a season going forward. So we're just closing it for this year. It's gonna reopen next year, assuming they pass it, okay? Now, the legal mechanism to close, to 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 initiate these kind of these, I, I don't want to don't call, I don't wanna to get too into the jargon, is the Division of Marine Fisheries has what's called proclamation authority, okay? And there's a lot that, there's a lot it can do and there's a lot it can't do. When they, implement a new proclamation it takes 40 it legally cannot take place for 48 hours okay gotcha. so assuming they take the plate vote on friday morning the fishery technically wouldn't close until sunday night or monday right does that make sense cool, yeah. it could be anything they could come in and say we're gonna you know let's say there was a mechanism to close sheep's head fishing you know it would be the same thing it doesn't matter what it is right or um you know for all these things any any fishery or just change by proclamation doesn't matter what it is it can't take place. To, it, it has a 48 hour window before it takes place. Right. Okay. And that's, I believe that's in statute. Gotcha. So. Absolutely. So that's, that's what that is. So Just if you fish. guys were thinking about fishing the fisherman's post tournament this weekend, I believe it's the Southport one that is still a go flounder will still be a part of that tournament. So make sure you jump on fisherman's post.com, check it out. And if you're going to sign up for that, I know that was obviously a, probably a big question for them and, and getting a lot of comments. So we uh, like those guys over there and want to want to make sure we, Tell, tell, you can tell you that here on the show. So awesome, man. Well, dude, I appreciate it. Judd, do you have anything else for him? I know we we're, man, I just want to say here. thank you for, uh, for coming on and talking about this and, uh, sharing your passion and, and being a voice for our fishery. It's awesome. Yeah, man. It's good. Appreciate you having me on. Look for sure, to man. To appreciate talk it. to you soon. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, guys. Good fishing. Tight lines. All right. Tight lines. See ya. Later. All right, dude. That's awesome, Judd. Man, what a great show. Good show. Good show. Uh, thank you, guys, everyone, for watching and uh, being you know being a part of the show. Thanks for for tuning in. And if you're listening to this or re-listening to this on the podcast, we appreciate it. Um, you know, Judd. I think Judd and I try to get a fair and balanced approach to everything, and especially being such a new voice in the community. We want to be fair representation uh, and keep 100%. it keep it as much on both sides as we can. Even though like our our knowledge base wasn't. Um, you know, super for my, for me anyway, I didn't have a lot of, you know, maybe not even good questions or great questions. Uh, but if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We'll forward those to Tom or get in touch with Tom, go to his website, um, um, and get, just be open-minded about this stuff, man. I think as a society in general with everything, we're better people when we can, when have good conversations and open conversations and, and really have differences. That's what makes the world go around. And, I love it, man. If I if people weren't different than me and different than you, then we'd all be doing the same thing. Exactly. So, exactly. Cool. 
Well, thanks, guys, and we will see y'all next week. Um, same time, same place. Awesome. Like and share. Yeah, yeah. Share and like the show. And then yeah, Jay, even after the show, share it. Please. And then Jay Grizzo put something here on the chat. So I just want to make sure uh, we shout out. His, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So the where was it in the here? The military appreciation. It's the fourteenth, right? September fourteenth. September fourteenth. Yep. So you can sign up and and uh, use your boat to take uh, people out on the water. Uh, military, retired and active military. Um, out fishing for a day, which is super cool. It's out of Southport. Uh, it definitely would be awesome if our community just kind of showed up and everyone was there with their boats, taking people fishing that don't usually get to. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, and also, while we're talking about this subject, if there are some commercial guys, I see a lot of them on here. Thank you for joining us. You're part of the conversation just as well as any rec guys. I would love to, if you're you know competent, there's a couple people that aren't, so I'm going to go back and check it. But if you're competent enough to have an educated conversation, I'd love to bring you on the show. We would absolutely Definitely. love to do that. Uh, you know, We're not here to sling mud on anybody, but we're here to learn, educate, and grow our community. So I put that in, invitation out there to you, and I will you know do some research to see if you're actually going to get on and have an educated conversation like we did with Tom or you know, just here with a, an agenda to trash other, other people out. So Yeah, we don't cool. appreciate that. But um, I was mistaken. It's <laughs> only active military. Only, only active, active military. Cool. Yep. So thanks, guys, for tuning in, and we will see you all next Absolutely. week. Absolutely. See you next week. Later. Thanks, guys.